Welcome to our talk hosted by the ventilator weaning and extubation in neurocritical care network, which is affiliated with the Nafil Department of Clinical Neurosciences. Um, I'm Arun Joseph, and I'm a DPhil in clinical neurosciences student at University of Oxford at Jesus College. And today, uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Sarah Wallace, uh, who will focus on laryngeal dysfunction in critical care, uh, the importance of early assessment, as well as the benefits of fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Um, and also, uh, Sarah would give us uh, some details about laryngeal rehabilitation approaches, uh, which can help with safe oral feeding, as well as tracheostomy weaning. Um, so Sarah is a consultant speech and language therapist in Manchester and also an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. Um, she's a clinical academic speech and language therapist um, with internationally recognized expertise in the field of critical illness and over 30 years of experience as a speech and language therapist as well. Um, we are very grateful, Sarah, to have you here with us and greatly looking forward to hear your interesting talk. Thank you so much, Jaron, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, it's a real honor to be here. And I, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to everybody uh, in the network. So um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. So I hope everyone can see the slides okay? Wonderful. So just for information, I am, um, as you said, a consultant SLT. So my post is 50-50 split, clinical and research. And clinically, I work in intensive care across general cardiothoracic um, complex um, weaning. And uh, with Ensure, we also have a long-term ventilation unit with um, complex home ventilation um, patients with progressive neuro conditions. And previously I've also worked in Singapore at Tan Tok Seng Hospital with um, spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury uh, rehabilitation as well. So as you said, quite, quite a few years <laughs> behind me. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna to talk today about laryngeal dysfunction going into the etiologies that we see in, in ICU and hopefully give you some predictors and methods of detection and then I'm actually going to talk a bit about impact in terms of impact psychologically on patients and the negative consequences of these problems and what happens if we don't address them. And then I'm going to talk about how we do approach rehabilitation um, and focus in, on a couple of things. So particularly restoring airflow and also something called pharyngeal electrical stimulation, which I hope will be of interest to you all. So just to clarify, when I talk about laryngeal function as a speech and language therapist, I'm considering all aspects, uh, including voice, swallowing, the airway protective cough, um, and also obviously the breathing via that patent upper airway. And therefore my assessment at the bedside in ICU incorporates all of these functions. And these are things that are going to be um, themes throughout this presentation today. I think the first thing to draw your attention to is, um, I'm sure you're aware that laryngeal dysfunction in ICU patients is very, very common. It's frequently complex though. Um, and that's because it's more or less always multifactorial. And I will be talking about all the different things that we should be trying to unpick when we're approaching treatment of this, this problem. And therefore, I think it obviously requires a multidisciplinary approach, but it also requires really sort of skilled management and expertise. Um, and that's where um, a speech and language therapist is, is really beneficial to the team. So let's look at etiologies and Actually, if we think about the research um, now, we're coming to the conclusion that there are about six top um, factors to consider in when you're looking at all your patients. So the first thing that is the most obvious thing is intubation and intubation trauma to the larynx. And that can be things like um, 
cuff compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve by the ET tube. Um, it can be a number of other things that I will actually talk a little bit more about uh, in the next few slides. But that laryngeal injury is often then increased when you have a patient who's intubated and actually quite agitated and moving around a lot. The more movement, the more that ET tube is likely to, to um, you know, injure uh, those delicate structures. And also, if you think about proning, the pressure that's exerted again on that on the uh, larynx is, is exacerbated, although there's not a lot of research to, to justify that, that hypothesis at the moment. The second thing we need to think about is the impact that airflow or lack of airflow has on the larynx. Um, so when the cuff is inflated on an ET tube, or a tracheostomy, that is going to lead to quite quickly desensitization of the whole mechanism. In addition to that, when a patient is ventilated, either invasively or non-invasively, or even high on high flow nasal, um, that there, there can be alterations to that whole breath swallow pattern, um, which is essential for good synchronization uh, for an airway protection for swallowing. So that can get really out of out of kilter. And therefore you can have patients with laryngeal issues leading to dysphagia and aspiration if, if that's not uh, understood um, and um, given therapy for, because you can teach a patient how to coordinate their breathing and swallowing better. Um, third thing is weakness. Now we know that these patients in ICU get very weak, um, basically, you know, when they're critically ill or when they've had lots of sedatives. But we also know that things like neuromyopathies have a really, really bad effect on the swallow in particular and the voice. And there's a study by Pomfic that demonstrated 91% of the patients with a myopathy actually have a dysphagia. So pretty much everybody. Um, and there's also a thing about sedatives, which leads to um, more depression of swallowing and, and disuse atrophy. So lots of things to, to think about there with weakness. And it doesn't always go hand in hand with improvement in physical weakness. We often have patients who are then mobilizing on the ward and doing really well with their physio, but are still really dysphagic. And it can happen the other way around too. Um, in terms of comorbidities, there's a lot of things that can interfere with laryngeal function in addition to everything I've said so far. Obviously, the most um, important one is neurological uh, injury or conditions such as Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, strokes, TBIs, all of those things in their own right uh, will, will potentially cause problems. And then we have other conditions that we know uh, are predisposing to dysphagia like COPD. And again, that whole breath swallow synchrony is a, is a real feature of that. Sepsis, um, because it's a degree of illness in a patient um, and head and neck cancers, cardiothoracic surgeries where they've injured the vagus nerve, all sorts of other things that can be, can be going on. Then we need to consider impaired cognition because that is definitely going to interfere with voicing and swallowing and uh, voluntary uh, control and insight and delirium, you know, is going to mean that patients with laryngeal dysfunction and dysphagia are going to be uh, slower to recover. And finally, laryngopharyngeal reflux. And I'm going to explain that on another slide about what, what that does to your larynx. So let's think about intubation first. Um, so in terms of the laryngeal injury, we know that it has potential to cause mucosal injuries, vocal cord palsies, inflammation and edema, uh, and as I said, direct compression of cranial nerves. And in particular, something that is a little bit unusual, but you may have come across called tapia syndrome, where you get um, injury of, from compression of um, the recurrent laryngeal and the glossopharyngeal nerves. The clinical things that occur as a result include patients complaining of pain or discomfort in the throat, um, dysphonia and dysphagia, um, and problems with airway patency. And obviously that's an issue if you have a patient who we're trying to wean from a tracheostomy or extubate safely or decannulate safely. 
Um, and these patients will often end up re-intubated um, if there's an issue there. And the risk factors that we know from research that increase these problems are when a patient has prolonged intubation, so that's just more than a couple of days, actually, patients who've been re-intubated because there's more likelihood that there will be trauma when the tube is removed and then replaced, um, and anyone with a difficult airway uh, where the intubation has been um, difficult to visualize, um, COVID, because we have had lots of patients with COVID who've had additional issues with the larynx um, that are exacerbated by intubation and tube size. And tube size is an interesting one, actually, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, so the impact of prolonged intubation and tube size um, is, is interesting because what we sometimes see or what I sometimes see when I scope these patients is not only granulation tissue and ulceration around the surface of the laryngeal vestibule and the vocal cords, but also a sort of freezing. Um, so the vocal cords are stuck and it, it seems as if there's a tube still there, even though there isn't an ET tube still there, but the cords are just stuck and they freeze and they're very tremulous. Um, and it takes a while for that to get going and you can stimulate that with therapy. So that's something that we need to be doing. Um, the other thing that's quite bad is if a patient develops posterior glottic stenosis where there's a band of scar tissue that that's, um, develops at the back of the larynx. And if you can see from the image where the ET tube presses between the arytenoids, then you get this tethering um, of the vocal cords and they're actually unable to open. So you've got what looks like bilateral vocal cord uh, palsy where the cords, cords are closed. So obviously that obstructs the airway. That's a risk for a patient in terms of needing a long-term tracheostomy and it, it, it really needs ENT input to try and open up that airway. But that is something we've been seeing more and more of um, and it was a particularly uh, increased incidence during uh, COVID, in COVID patients. But you'll see from the research that UTT size 8 is associated with aspiration and granulation. So that's a standard size tube. So if we look at the research around the impact of intubation on the laryngeal sensation, then we know that um, there are problems here. Um, the laryngeal adductor reflex, and that's the when you have bilateral fire, firing of the thyroarytenoid muscles that close the cords for airway protection. That that's the LAR, and that is essential for airway protection. So that is absent in fifty percent of patients post extubation. Okay, so that's really high proportion. And when it's absent, these patients are 6.8 times more likely to develop pneumonia. Not surprisingly, if they can't close their cords and, not, and they can't protect their airway when they need to, um, then that's going to develop aspiration pneumonia potentially. And the significant association is between intubation duration, presence of excess secretions in the larynx and aspiration. So sensation is, is really um, something we need to pay a lot of attention to. There's a lot of focus often in IC patients on weakness, but in, um, in my field, we tend to look a lot at the sensation because without the sensory response, there is no uh, muscle or motor response to swallow. Just want to show you a picture of a normal larynx before I start showing you video clips of um, abnormalities. So you've got an idea in your head, this is normal and you can be see beautiful thin white vocal cords in a nice open position. Everything looks uh, really nice, no swelling, um, good space around the larynx as well and the piriforms and the molecular. So that's a normal larynx. This is a, a larynx in a patient who was intubated um, in an emergency because he had status epilepticus. And um, he ended up dysphonic and dysphagic for a couple of months that you can see the trauma to the cords, you can see the, the sloughy tissue at the back, and you can also see swelling, can't you, of the arytenoids? And I hope you can also see that the cords don't close. They're trying to, but they don't fully close. So that patient's going to, has struggled with their voice and their swallow as a result for quite a long time. 
Here you can see the sensory, an example of the sensory impairment. So this patient's swallowing some blue water and they do a swallow, which is the white bit, but you'll see the aspiration occurs before they swallow. So it's on a loop, you can see it again. The water tracks down, enters the larynx from the back, from the posterior uh, into retinoid space, and they aspirate completely silently. And there's also granulation, but I'm not really bothered about that. The problem is more sensory because they don't trigger the swallow quickly enough and they don't cough. So hopefully that gives you some idea of what uh, fees can show. Uh, and you can see the blue, actually the blue water sitting on top of the tracheostomy tube underneath the vocal cords. So, and here's an example of pharyngeal edema. Um, this is something we see really often in ICU patients. You can see secretion sitting below the cords and in the, uh, the behind the cords as well. And everything looks really red. Even the pharyngeal wall is swollen. Uh, and the vocal cords are really chunky. And again, there will be sensory, the sensory impairment there because that patient is not coughing on those secretions and the cough is down. So the other problem is lack of airflow here. There must be swelling, swelling further down as well because the secretions are not moving. So in terms of risk factors for um, long-term dysphagia, having a tracheostomy is a big one. And obviously the tracheostomy tube itself isn't the problem it's the reason for the tracheostomy and the illness around that and the comorbidities that are causing the issues. And if we think a bit more about the cuff inflation and the impact of that and ventilation on the swallow, this is what it's doing. Um, so the airflow when the cuff is up is completely bypassing the upper airway as we know. And this is impairing the laryngeal and the pharyngeal sensory system and impairing that elicitation of a motor swallow response. So you're not, so basically patients stop swallowing the minute they're intubated. And then once they're tracked and cuffs up, they just stop swallowing. So obviously then you're in a bit of a pickle because they then get disuse atrophy. They also silently aspirate. So you don't know what's happening from the bedside potentially. Um, and the other thing that's happening, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, a, a lack of subglottic pressure. So because there's no airflow, when they cough, um, there's no glottic uh, coordination with that and the airway clearance is really, really difficult. So secretions also pool and they're not responsive to that, they don't feel them. And you get asynchronous movement of the cords because there's no proper stimulus. And also we know that patients have reduced taste and smell as well. Um, there's a whole lot more stuff to read about this. Um, a paper I did with Professor Brendan McGrath, we uh, have covered pretty much everything to do with this. So if you were interested, you can read more about that. And there's some questions at the end of the paper as well to test yourself. Um, and this is a diagram that we did in that paper, which shows you exactly where from research, the key areas of trauma are to the larynx when you are intubated. A note about sedation. So in its own right, sedation actually can lead to pharyngeal weakness. So it's not just the fact that the patient has generally been sedated and is globally weak. Um, it's the study, this is a really nice study that shows the effect of midazolam, benzos and ketamine, which depressed the laryngeal reflex, but also led to pharyngeal weakness and dysphagia and silent aspiration. So it's um, it's another factor, really, that not, nothing we can do about it, <laughs> particularly, but it's something that we need to think about when we're taking our history of the patient. Um, and now reflux. As I said, this is another etiology in the top six, um, and this leads to um, problems with inflammation of the larynx. So we see edema sometimes just at the back of the larynx. The patients will often get develop a granuloma in, in and around the back of the vocal cords. Um, again, sensations impaired, or sometimes it's hypersensitivity that we see. Um, and consequently, I think when you have reflux going on, it's worsening everything and worsening voice and swallowing problems. Um, here's a bit of a rogues gallery of some of uh, my patients actually, where I've sort of felt that 
reflux was also a factor. I think you can see on the left, this patient's got significant laryngeal edema. It's actually quite hard to recognize um, the larynx. You can just about see the vocal cords underneath and lots of secretions that they're not sensate to. Uh, here in the middle, a really quite a large granuloma, which is definitely going to in, impinge on vocal cord closure. Um, and then over here, it's hard to tell, but this is a close up of the back of the vocal cords, the glottis, and there's a web of tissue that's growing there that's tethering things. So all sorts of different things that we see. And in terms of things that heighten the risk of laryngeal injury and dysphagia, I've mentioned a few of them, um, but we also need to consider things like diabetes, uh, which has a twofold increase in dysphagia, age, um, which increases your risk of vocal cord paralysis threefold, and that's from the age of 50. So to be honest, that's to me not, not old. Um, and then things like malnutrition, obesity, um, difficult airway and hepatic and renal failure. And these all are, are things that affect tissue perfusion and predispose to injury, neuropathy, weakness and loss of physiological reserve in, in the voice and the swallow. So how do you know from a bedside? So what sort of things could you be looking for to give you a heads up? So these are probably the main things that I would suggest. Things like patients awake and tube tolerant, um, weak hoarse voice, altered voice, stridor, excess secretions. It's pretty obvious when that's a, a problem for a patient. Weak cough, vulgar issues, dysarthric speech, um, and having a tracky. So that, that's your list. If you're going to carry anything around with you on the wards uh, to help you pick out these patients, I would uh, sort of think about those things. Um, I'd like to just raise um, a slide here around how common dysphagia actually is, because we know, for instance, about 30% of hospitalized patients are dysphagic. We know in things like subarachnoid hemorrhage, <clears throat> 35, about 35% um, are dysphagic, but then largely severely dysphagic when they are. Um, we've got studies that showed, you know, fairly large number of patients who had trauma um, intubated for 48 hours are dysphagic. Most of patients with trachees will be dysphagic and most will aspirate silently. And the things that I'm considering um, are when I see a patient are <clears throat> is this an acute dysphagia or is this an acute on a chronic, usually un undetected problem? Um, so it's really important I get a thorough history to, to try and figure that one out because obviously that's going to affect prognosis for recovery. And is the, uh, are the problems I'm seeing sensory, motor or both? Um, it tends to be both, but um, you know we need to figure that out because that will tell us what to do about it. So how do we detect laryngeal dysfunction as, as a speech and language therapist? So we'll always start in ICU with a bedside assessment. And these are the things that I'm uh, doing and, and looking at. So voice quality, if there is a voice, um, we can use outcome measures such as the GRABUS, which is a perceptual scale that help us to, to sort of quantify the degree of impairment with voice. Um, it stands for grade, roughness, breath, breathiness, asthenia, um, and, oh gosh, what's S? I've completely gone blank. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that. <laughs> and there's also loudness and pitch as well. Um, and then uh, oromotor uh, and cranial nerve exams are very important. It doesn't matter if your patient is sat there cuff inflated. These are things we're gonna be doing either way. Cuff, cuff status is irrelevant. Um, we should be seeing a tracky patient the minute they start their sedation hold. It's nothing to do with cough up, cough down or whatever. You know, we're way beyond that, uh, you know, way of working. Um, we'd be trialing, uh, if appropriate, cough deflation and one-way valve to see what happens. Um, and it really helps as an assessment of the upper airway function. We'd be looking at secretion management and we'll potentially be doing oral trials. Now, we don't do all of those things all the time, but obviously that's our judgment on the day. Um, 
And then we also have fees and fees is absolutely vital. Um, this is our uh, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation swallowing. We do this at the bedside. It's ideal for ICU. Um, there's no prep for this. The patient just needs to be awake. We can visualize really accurately the upper airway. Um, this is really helpful for everybody in the team. Um, we can see the structures, we can see the function, the secretion management in detail and the swallow safety, obviously. Swallow safety on oral trials is just one bit of this uh, really in, important assessment, this comprehensive assessment. Um, and it's actually the only accurate way to detect aspiration and silent aspiration and swallow safety when the cuff is inflated. And I will, um, you know, consider doing fees on a patient with a cuff inflated if there's no way we can get the cuff down. Uh, for instance, I work with patients on ECMO uh, on the cardi cardiothoracic unit, and sometimes they are awake, but really not, not able to have cuff down yet. They're too unstable, but they may uh, be swallowing and I might want to use a fees. And I've had patients where they've actually been able to eat and drink on ECMO with the cough inflated um, early on after doing some rehab. So weaning is not necessarily a barrier and without fees, I would not know that. And I would be keeping those patients nil by mouth. Um, if you wanna know any more about fees, uh, we have videos that we've made on the NTSP website there. So fees is really beneficial for aiding diagnosis um, in particularly in the neuro population that swallow profile that we get from a fees can really help inform um, the etiology uh, and the, the sort of type of neuro uh, problems that we're seeing or, or not. Um, we also can really come up with a secretion management plan and that because to me it's not enough to just see the problem it's to treat the problem um, so we need to be proactive um, but I can't do that without looking. So coming up with a secretion management plan with the team, um, that's obviously going to help earlier weaning, you'd, you'd hope. Um, and I can do this in-depth analysis to get a swallow map. And therefore, I can target my treatment. And I'm going to talk about what the options are for treatment. But I can pick what things I think need to be done um, and in what kind of sequence of, of events. Um, I can obviously make oral intake recommendations as well um, with some confidence because I, I can see the level of risk of aspiration. Um, I can assess for the upper airway collapse and laryngospasm. So we know that laryngospasm is you know, not uncommon in patients with MND, for instance, um, and scoping them does not necessarily increase the risk that, that will happen, but it's actually really super helpful for me to see it and watch laryngospasm and understand it. And it's really helpful to inform the physios on whether cough assist um, is going to be helpful, because if you've got collapse and laryngospasm, cough assist is not potentially going to work. And we do an, a, what's called an MIE fees, um, mechanical insufflation exflation fees, where we can tailor the cough assist dependent on the laryngeal response uh, during a fees. So it's, it's a really cool thing to do. Um, and obviously airway collapse is really uh, not good for news for a patient because it often means then that, that we're not gonna be able to decannulate. Um, in PDOC patients, it's really good to do fees to see that reflexive swallow, again, secretions and suitability for oral stimulation trials. And then in terms of doing treatment, it's really good to use a fees again to, to see has the treatment done anything. So it's very repeatable fees. Um, so yeah, it's it kind of can't really do my job without it um, on ICU. And it's great for biofeedback to show the patients what, what the problem is and to really help them understand it. Um, so the next thing I'm just gonna talk about is impact. So Having laryngeal issues, laryngopharyngeal dysfunction is bad for you. <laughs> um, apart from the obvious things like your risks of aspiration pneumonia, it's definitely something that can reduce the ability to wean or slow down the wean. 
if not managed um, optimally. Obviously also it affects a person's ability to communicate um, if they can't voice. Um, and when they can't communicate, we know from research that they're three times more likely to have an adverse medical event. So the consequences are very wide. This is you know, way beyond my remit as a speech therapist. This, this affects everything in their recovery. They're more malnourished potentially because we may need to keep them no by mouth while we do therapy. Um, they fatigue more quickly potentially then if they're not nourished well or they don't feel like they're nourished because they're not eating. That also affects their mood, uh, creates anxiety, particularly when they can't communicate and reduces their engagement with rehabilitation um, as a whole. We know from studies as well that they tend to have a longer length of stay in ICU and hospital, and they have a worse functional outcome and a higher rate of mortality. And this study is quite interesting because it talks about post-extubation dysphagia as being associated with poor outcomes. They, they found um, an 84% dysphagia rate post-extubation, and that this was associated, these patients with um, re-intubation, pneumonia, length of stay, as I've said, discharge status as well, and discharge destination, need for PEG and in-hospital mortality. So um, really important that we deal with these issues, isn't it? Um, I was really pleased to hear Professor Stephen Hawking speak a, a, a number of years ago, actually just before he passed away at our um, International Tracheostomy Symposium. And he said um, the worst thing about his condition um, was choking on food and not being able to swallow. He also said, and obviously communication is a challenge, although he communicates so brilliantly um, with his alternative aids. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Um, he also had had a tracheostomy. Um, and, and I've done a study with um, Helen Newman as part of her PhD, which looked at the um, research around what matters most to patients with a tracheostomy in ICU. Um, we did a systematic review and what came through really strongly was the importance of voice, which was crucial to identity. And um, what came through was that when voice was missing, patients felt totally powerless. And therefore it's all of our responsibilities, I think, to restore voice uh, early and it should be a priority for the patient, but also for humanization of care, because it's very difficult for staff to really deliver that when the patient's struggling to communicate. So um, the last part of my talk is rehab methods. And um, I'd like to start with this uh, fairly recent study actually, which showed that when you have delayed intervention um, by SLT, there was an association with post-extubation dysphagia and death. So early intervention is something I talk a lot about and try to promote um, because we know it works. We know it helps patients uh, in their recovery immensely. We have national guidelines to support that. Um, and uh, you know, I've been very uh, thankful to be involved in all of these documents, To but we know from evidence now that ICU patients and all tracheostomies um, should have that timely access to SLT. It's hard to define timely, but basically we say, you know, as early as, as possible. And the SLTs must have access to fees. It doesn't mean you have to fees every patient, and it doesn't mean that you only do fees. We do everything, but we must have that access to have optimal management. So what do we do? Um, so I put this um, rehabilitation side into three themes. So firstly, airflow. Um, uh, airflow is about early cuff down and passive valve use in the tracheostomized patients. When you can't get the cuff down, we can use above cuff vocalization. And it's also, airflow is also about optimal tube selection, isn't it? And downsizing and, and such as uh, those such things. And then we have treatments. So we have lots of things at our disposal. We can use swallow strengthening exercises. 
Uh, we can use a new tool for tongue strengthening called IOP. Um, we can do oral stimulation trials or sometimes called therapeutic tastes. And we can use something called EMST, uh, which is expiratory muscle strength training. And these are all being used in ICUs, we hope, but again, not everywhere. And I'm not going to really talk a lot about all of those, but I am going to talk about pharyngeal electrical stimulation. Um, and then the last bit is medications. And obviously this is all about the team discussing what's appropriate to do, but we can definitely use medications where we need to and where airflow isn't working to stimulate swallowing. We may need to use medications such as hyacine, atropine, glycoperonium, Botox injections to the salivary glands to help support weaning where you know, the patient is not learning how to swallow. So we, we can do things with, with medications and it's a, com it's a balance, isn't it, with um, ourselves and physio to try to work out those upper and lower airway secretions because we don't want to make lower airway secretions more viscous, but we do want to control saliva sometimes. Um, we can also optimize um, reflux with uh, PPI drugs. So uh, things like esomeprazole, um, is really helpful at just managing that that uh, reflux risk. The standard lansoprazole and meprazole that's used on ICU is not a high enough dose, so we will potentially increase that and use a different drug. And then we've got steroids, and again, very very judicious uh, use, I think, of steroids in these patients because the last thing we want to do is worsen weakness and cause other problems. So it's about risk and benefit discussions. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second. So let's just think a little bit about early cuff down and one-way valve. Um, this is a recent paper that we did, um, Sue McGowan and Annalisa Sutton, myself, which basically describes the, um, the kind of preferred way to wean the patients, which prioritizes voice and, and swallowing recovery. So the first thing we always try to do is early cuff down um, and with the one-way valve, because without the one-way valve, we don't get the benefits uh, to laryngeal function. So if we can't do that, we can use ACV and we can do cuff down with leak speech. It doesn't restore the physiology though, and it doesn't give you that subglottic pressure if you just have leak. So that, one-way valve, passimule valve, which is the only inline valve we can use in ventilated patients, isn't it? Um, does a lot because it normalizes the physiology because it's closed bias valve. It allows you to breathe in, but not breathe out. And every bit of air goes through the larynx. It's restoring some intrinsic peep as well, and it's restoring glottic control. And we can see that on fees. We can see that from research. And because of that, subglottic pressure, it pushes things out of the glottis, out of the larynx, and it reduces aspiration risk. Um, you can have, we can put it on and take it off during a feast to just observe the effect of the PMV. It's important to know if it changes the shape of the airway, if it stents it open a bit, if it helps secretion expulsion, and if it reduces aspiration when we give oral trials, which sometimes it does. So we you know we'll be able to advise on that basis, you know, only feed this patient if they're wearing a PMV, um, because it can change things dramatically. But sometimes it doesn't, and that's also important to know. In that paper, we got uh, also a whole table of troubleshooting with one-way vowels, because we know that people sometimes struggle with um, trying to um, incorporate a valve in, in line, depending on what ventilator they're using and, and, and managing that. So there's a lot of myths actually around not tolerating a valve. To me, it's like, well, why, what happened? You know, it's more important to understand, was it just something that wasn't quite done properly? Um, so yeah, really helpful, hopefully troubleshooting table to help you kind of overcome all of those uh, sort of issues. And then ACV, um, which I don't use very often, but I, I have it in as a tool to use when, as I said, we, we can't do uh, cuff deflation. 
um, obviously the upper airway needs to be patent. Um, we're delivering airflow via the subglottic port, so they have to have a subglottic tube um, when the cuff is up. So we don't need to make any ventilator adjustments or anything. We can leave the cuff up. Um, and we can sometimes get some voice, but also the other rationale for ACV, from my point of view, is therapeutic swallow stimulation. Uh, and that's uh, what uh, our second paper that I did with uh, Vassam Grad showed was that some changes to the swallow occur. Um, and again, you can visualize the effect of that on fees. Obviously, there's risks with ACV, um, mainly face, neck, swelling, subcutaneous emphysema, if the air is not escaping freely uh, upwards. So here's a video uh, which um, shows that air expulsion of secretions when you blow airflow through the subglottic port. And also, I think you can see that the vocal cords start to move and close there at the end. So we've actually stimulated the LAR in the moment just with a bit of airflow. Uh, so it's quite dramatic sometimes um, what that can do. So that to me is therapeutic. Uh, that gets the larynx working basically. Um, this is a couple of fees images to show you the impact of medications. So this was an 18 year old Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy um, young man uh, admitted to to ICU for pneumonia. Um, you can see on this fees here, um, which we did because he was showing no leak with the cuff down at bedside, no voice, and he wasn't tolerating a one-way valve. So I had a look, and as you can see here, a, quite a tiny airway. Um, some milk there is tracking down into his uh, vocal cords, but we talked to the consultant, we agreed that it was warranting use of DEX. And as you can see, uh, that it does show the benefit of DEX. He now has an airway. He's got a collapsed or prolapsed retinoid, which is why it still looks asymmetrical. But he had sufficient airway to tolerate a valve, get some good voice, have a safe swallow, and he could eat and drink on the vent. So that was a really beneficial management. And then finally, pharyngeal electrical stimulation. So this is uh, where we deliver peripheral stimulation to the sensory nerves using a base station and a special NG tube, um, which is placed into the pharynx. Um, it's, it's a feeding tube, but it's got, um, it's got ele electrodes around it that sit in the pharynx. Those signals excite um, the damaged and undamaged motor cortex, and that excitation drives neuroplasticity and actually They've shown from lots of studies, functional reorganization of swallowing, um, and it actually can restore neurological swallow control. Um, we've even seen from some studies an increase in substance P, which is a really important neuropeptide that we find in saliva and in pharyngeal mucosa. When we don't have enough substance P, the swallow frequency is significantly reduced. So anything that increases substance P is actually potentially really helpful. So you can see here where the catheter sits, um, it creates this sort of peripheral super electrical field, super bolus targeting um, a number of sensory nerves just to stimulate swallowing. And in January this year, there's a nice um, interventional procedure guideline uh, produced, which uh, I was involved as, um, as a sort of expert because I've been using it for five, six years in, six years in ICU patients at Withenshaw um, and it's I've, so I've got quite a bit of experience with this um, and what they've recommended for now until we get a bit more research is that it's safe to use for neurogenic dysphagia patients with a tracheostomy after stroke we need more research in other areas um, as you can see though there's quite a lot of research that's been done here's all the papers um, and here's all the different features of uh, you know, improvements that we've seen from different studies. So increased substance P, improved secretion management, airway safety, less reintubation, et cetera, et cetera. And there are some studies that have been using it on intubated patients as well. Um, and finally, increased diet um, and nutritional independence. So really, really promising treatment um, and that 
you know, I advocate for. I've seen some remarkable results with it. So my take home messages are, um, I guess laryngeal dysfunction is common. Early detection in, and intervention uh, is really important because it will help, I think, restore voice, humanization of care. It helps with diagnosis, um, targeting treatment. You know, I don't believe in just throwing everything at everybody. It's about targeted treatments. We're aiming obviously to reduce complications like pneumonia by managing dysphagia better. And we're aiming for safer weaning and decannulation. Um, and I think that's where fees is incredibly helpful for the team. And obviously we know that with something like fees, we tend to implement a safe oral feeding much earlier um, than patients who have just had bedside assessments because we tend to be a bit more cautious when we don't when we can't see. Um, and obviously for patients like Richard here, it really improves mood and quality of life. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'd like to also draw your attention to the Right to Rehab campaign, which is currently ongoing, uh, led by the Intensive Care Society and a uh, petition, if you're interested, to sign that we're trying to get signatures for to get um, improvement in rehab in terms of strategies and leads in every hospital and health board. So please consider doing that and sharing it. Um, I have lots and lots of references that you may find helpful. Um, and I have, uh, if it's okay to finish with a video of a patient of mine talking about his experiences. Good afternoon, Nick. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me this afternoon and for agreeing to share your experiences. Um, Absolutely. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name is Michael Pratt. I'm 65. I'm married with my children. I like golf, swimming, and travel. And uh, I came in originally with a heart replacement operation. Uh, Dawn and Sharp Hospital. It was a planned operation. I went down as per normal to uh, surgery. And uh, during the course of the anesthesia, they came upon a problem which he couldn't ventilate in the airway. So, which meant I couldn't breathe. Uh, and after some, uh, quite a lot of people said in the day, they managed to bury me. Get a traco traco was in the side and discharged me and then I went back two days later for my heart so yeah. I was in the ICU for nine ten days unable to communicate speak read or drink no pineapple uh everybody uh giving me the best of kill but no one communicating with me or telling me I explained what was on I couldn't text my wife I couldn't I don't have to have contact. And people just stood around me, talking around me and about me, but not to me, mm -hmm. which was very overwhelming. And you feel lonely, you feel emotional, you feel like crying, you know, it's, 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 like, it's, the, it's the whole gamut of all the emotions you go through, you have to feel, but you go through it all every single day because. You feel like screaming, but you can't scream even because you you know voice, you know. So yeah. that, that's where you find yourself. I had no idea what was going on, nothing clue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one day the uh, speech therapy team arrived and uh, a lady sat down early at the bed and started telling me what had gone wrong exactly from start to finish and tried uh, to uh, put a camera down the nose and we had a swallow test which I've, I've never heard about before. So, but from there we went on a, 
a drop regime to produce the swelling, remove the original fracture, put a small one in, which happened within four to five years, I'm not exactly sure, but five years probably at the most, which enabled them to be able to swallow, eat, drink, and talk, which was amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, it turned the car on the country. Yeah. Sounds very difficult. How does it feel? I think it'd be interesting to know how it feels when you're in that position where you can't communicate you're using your voice. It feels absolutely catastrophic. It's, it's just, it's the lowest, it's the lowest I've ever felt in my life because there were nothing constructive about any of the conversations. So you're out of the loop, you're lost, feels though you, you you know, you know, you look at the skirt, you're lonely, come for my wife, come use me mobile, I couldn't do anything, you know, it's quite a lot of, you know, full circle of emotions, which you think you're never going to experience in your life, seems to happen all at once, loneliness, despair, uh, you're thinking you're never going to get better. I don't know if it's a two-way street or a one-way street, but because I couldn't talk, I think people just never spoke to me either. You know, decided, no, you can't tell, you know, there's no point engaging them in any way, shape, or form. What's helping for us to understand better is um, when you when you start to get your voice back, how does that change your recovery and how you feel well, about it? Yeah, it helps in quite a number of ways because, first of all, you can communicate for a start, you can ask questions. You can convey what's wrong with you, how you're feeling, what you're, what you're going through, you're, you're in pain, your leg hurts, shoulder hurts, bum hurts, whatever you have. Your voice was obviously real. Yeah. Do you remember that moment? I remember, I'll never forget that moment. It's, uh, it's one of the uh, greatest moments in my life when I put it back on. I can't explain, it's euphoric, you know, when you get, you just come back as though you've been, come back from the dead. Basically, that's how it feels. Okay, so that's uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I think Mick explains it better than I could, but I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you, Sarah. That was a very interesting talk, and you have condensed so many uh, aspects of speech swallow, um, post extubation dysphagia um tracheostomy as well as humanizing the whole aspects of it so that we are not just focused on the um physiology aspects of it so thank you so much for um providing us the talk um and for your time and this is the time for any uh, particular questions that any of you have uh, it's an opportunity